to Unit 12 of Agent Rising Real Estate School and Training Center. Good job. Uh, this is Caitlin <coughs> McGregor. We're going to talk about real estate contracts. Okay. So, as with all chapters, the best way to study this, especially if you're doing some on your own, <coughs> is to have your, your iPhone out and your voice command or your whatever, your, your recorder, and have the book open, record the progress as you go. Uh, identify any questions you have, and visit the forum on agentrising.com if you have any questions. Okay? Okay, so contracts. The real estate market is driven by contracts. A real estate professional must, not, must know not only what a contract means, but also how it is created, what is required of the parties to the contract, and how the contract is concluded. So this I can tell you about contracts is the, the concept of garbage in, garbage out, is completely relevant to contracts. So the stronger and the clearer you make your contracts, the easier your job is going to be. Okay, as I say, so if you um, kind of are sloppy with your contracts, or you shortcut them, or you decide that you don't really need them, then you, you're making your profession more difficult. Okay? Um, there's, when you when you do the contracts, there's, there's tutorials on the, on the form on how to do them. There's people in your office that would kind of help you with days and dates or whatever. And it's really important that you stay on top of your contracts and you stay, uh, you know, you stay in contract. So what I'm going to suggest you do is, again, back to your, your handy dandy phone, is whenever you execute a contract, which means that you have both the, the, the buyer and the seller or you and the other person sign it, you go to your phone and to your calendar and you mark it in there then. Okay, so the first would be your listing contract. What day do you have the listing coming up for renewal? Okay, it'll tell you on MLS when you, you plug in. However, if you have it so that when you're doing your, you know, your, your business look for the, of your month, whatever, and you see it like a week before, you see that you're going to want to talk to that person. It also gives you enough time if you've been kind of, um, I don't know, like being kind of casual with that listing. It gives you some time to put some things <coughs> in motion to make sure that you have a list of things to prepare. It also gives you a chance to prepare what you've done for them. So that means getting your, your, your sh like, the other thing you're going to want to do with your calendar is always put into your calendar who it is and what it is and when you show it. So when your book is showing, sometimes when I'm like, well, driving and someone asks for an appointment, I'll just say like, you know, like Clark Street, one o'clock. So I don't say who it is I'm showing it with. I don't say who the agent is. I don't say what the results are. Use your calendar, okay? And make like a list, like, who, who is, is their co broke? What their name is? Who the buyer is? What their contact information is if there's a number? And then go back later and write down how it went. Okay, so then when the time comes and you have in your calendar that you're, you're expiring on the 20th and it's the first or second and you're looking at your month, you can actually go through your calendar and see how many times you showed it, what the results were, and how you, how you handled them, right? So these are all like little business things to do, and um, it just makes it a lot easier. When you go and contract on a purchase and sales agreement or in, a comp or in an offer, what happens when you have those dates in there is you, you won't miss dates, okay? You're the one who's in charge of making sure that you don't go out of contract. So if there's a commitment date that's coming up, and a commitment date is when a mortgage needs to get a, a commitment from the bank, okay? If you miss that date, and, you, and that's a protection for your for your for your buyer, then you know what? Then you have done them a disservice, you know, and you, you may be in big, you may be going, you may be in trouble, but you don't want that to happen. You want to be the professional, and you also want to be driving the bus. So you don't want them to have to ask you, okay? You want to ask them, you know, and you want to make sure that you are on top of it and they know that you are, you know what's going on. And also your close dates, you know, so when it comes time, like, and it sounds like that you're filling your calendar, like, you know, the close date's not for two months. You know, do I really need to put it in my calendar now? Yes, because as you schedule things like dentist appointments or whatever, it's there, you know about it. When you're looking at your snapshot for the, for the month, you'll see where it is. If you're a kind of person that has set their goals so that you want to have certain things happen each month as you go along to keep your pipeline going, this visual will be really important to you, okay? Um, I use Google Calendars. It's free. It shows right up on my phone. It's, um, it's, it's, it's all I need. You know, I've, I've bought a couple other ones, like, you know, like the Franklin Planner and the, you know, there's a couple other ones just because they look like they would help it, but I don't, I don't pay attention to those. I just, or whatever, I don't, I'm not the kind of person that goes back to that. 
Um, so just make it simple, make it a system you can use. Um, yes? I wanted to say this to you the other day. Uh, I forgot. When you do the voice recordings, yeah. just because I have been in the class before and it was a while before, I ended up switching phones halfway through. So I suggest emailing them to either yourself or someone else because if something happens to your phone, everything you, you recorded is gone. And that already happened to me. Once. That's a good point because we save them for you. The other thing is, is that if you have if you have Google, a Google email, you have a Google Drive, right? And that means that that's a place where you can save everything. So you can actually take your recording. It has that little arrow that shoots it up. And you can email it to yourself as one thing. You can send it to your drive and just store it there. And then that way you can access it from anywhere. When you're home on your computer, you don't have your phone, your phone's charging, but you want to listen to it, you can put it right on your, you can play it right from your phone, I mean right from your computer. Okay, if you guys need help with that, we can help you, not during these 40 hours, but we can help you with that at any time. It's, it, it's yeah, it, it stinks when you lose something you've worked on. Yeah, I switched phones in the middle of it. And so my dad, I saw him doing, it. recording his recordings the other day, and I said, are you mm -hmm. kidding me? Huh? Like, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. It gets back to that squirrely page. Okay. Um, so our chapter objectives are to describe the essential elements of a contract, explain the various means by which a contract may be enforced, terminated, assigned, or replaced, and describe the primary written agreements in forms used by real estate sales and leasing. Okay. So here are our <coughs> terms for this chapter. Addendum, amendment, assignment, bilateral contract, Breach of contract, consideration, contingencies, contract, counteroffer, disclosure, earnest money, enforceable contract, executed contract, executory contract, express contract, implied contract, land contract, <laughs> liquidated damages, novation, offer and acceptance, option, owner financing, purchase money mortgage, rescission, Statue of Frauds, Suit for Specific Performance, Time is of the Essence, <coughs> Unenforceable Contract, Unilateral Contract, Valid Contract, Void Contract, and Voidable Contract. Okay, so this, there's a ton of vocabulary in this chapter, a unit. And these are all things that, this is a really relevant chapter. Okay, so there's a lot of this that will be on the test. So this is one that really, I would have my, my tape recorder, my book, my, my, uh, Live presentation, and I would really be taking it and going through these vocab words, okay? Because there's a couple in there that are kind of they like, and they they kind of mess you up a little. Okay, so a contract must be voluntary, which means that there's no coercion going into it. All right, um, a, an agreement or a promise. So there has to be something that you're agreeing to, or that you're promising. So it has to be some sort of act happens with it, made by legally competent parties. Supported by lawful consideration. So what is consideration? Money. 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 Normally money. Yep. Um, and then for a legal act. Okay, so you can't enter into a contract to, you know, buy some pot. Well, maybe pot, but, you know. Because, <laughs> right, there's some legal legalities there now. But, uh, so anyways, it has to be something that's legal. Um, Did you get all these notarized? No. That's no. why, as a matter of fact, when we say uh, voluntary, generally speaking, there's going to be times in the course of, of their their thing that they need things notarized, then that's when you are agreeing that or acknowledging that it's of your own free will. But you actually do not do it for, for, offer, for any of it until the lawyers get involved. Okay? Um, okay. I wish I knew. Okay. I'm hoping that it's. I'm trying to see that slide because I don't know how much to go into something right now. But, okay, so let's just talk about types of contracts. All right, an express contract is we talked about this a little bit earlier it's when you are actually signing it you've talked about it it's expressed everybody knows what we're talking about it's you know when i talked to you earlier about uh like that dual agency thing like you know it's, it's not implied it's, it's it's an express contract whether it's a listing agreement where you authorize it i authorize it it's expressed okay it's written implied the implied contracts are the ones that you don't have spelled out you know what we said like a listing agreement doesn't have to be in writing um, to be valid, it, it could be that it's implied, you know, so, or it could be that it's that buyer's agent, which is where most of our implications come. You know, you're showing houses to this person, you think it's implied that you're working for them, that you're their buyer's agent. They may never have said that. They may say to you at some point in time, oh, 
I never said like you were my my only agent. And so you thought they you thought you were because you're doing everything for them, but they didn't think that. Or maybe they did for a while, but then they changed their mind and we had nothing in writing. Okay. Anything that's implied is a heartbreak waiting to happen. Okay. Statue of frauds means again in Massachusetts it needs to be enforceable. I mean it needs to be in writing and authorized to be enforceable. Alright, this is my favorite. Someone in this room might have heard me talking about these before. Um, okay, a bilateral agreement is both sides agree to it. Okay? You know, this person agrees to sell and this person agrees to buy. Bilateral, they both agree. Versus a unilateral condition contract in which only one side agrees. Okay, so um, I used to say this, to, I do say this to my kids sometimes, like when they'll say like, um, we need to go shopping. Right, that's a unilateral contract. I never agreed to go. You know, and they're going like, oh no, well, we're going. And I'm like, that's a unilateral contract. You agree. You said we needed to. I never said I was going. Right, so a bilateral contract is both parties agree. A unilateral is one. Okay. An ex executed contract is one that has been done, right? So it's been completed. Um, it's, it's interesting, like when you talk about in real estate, you know, the transaction is ex executed at the closing. However, it is a little bit tricky, is that um, the, so the time between the executed contract, which is the closing, is the executory, which means that you have all the agreements, everybody signed on it, but it has not happened. So you're in an executory stage. Okay? So going to happen, everything's signed, there's a date that makes it that it would be executed. Okay? The, there's a trick on that, in that in the purchase and sales agreement, they call a purchase and sales agreement executed when the paperwork is signed. But it's not. It's actually executed when the contract, okay? So um, if I had a, if I would ever remember like to tell them that they should change that word, you know, <laughs> be great. But anyways, um, those are two down that. Executed is done. Executory is it's in the <coughs> works, okay? So the creation of a valid contract, and this is enormous in um, our offers because, uh, again, we, we get, we get a little, either, either we get um, sloppy, or the other person doesn't have the same policy, or we're in the middle, but the first is offer and acceptance. Okay, so we make an offer on something, you're, you're, the, you're the, the buyer's agent that makes the offer. Okay, so the other side counter offers. Okay, we're gonna talk about it a little bit later. So you have nothing then, right? So you go back and forth until it gets accepted, okay? So you have the offer, there's a verbal acceptance, you know, the paperwork is drawn up for the purchase and sales, it's not signed, right? So do you have anything that's binding? You have two people that have said that they're gonna do it, right? <coughs> so is it, it's not binding, because you have an offer and acceptance, right? The other, so you don't have signatures. So my point is, is that for an offer, Right? They call them a contract to purchase. All right, so it's the first step, get them signed. There are some companies out there that don't sign them, right? So they're like, oh, we don't sign those. They're not the same thing as the PNS. We're good, we're good. The PNS is drawn up, whatever, we're fine. Okay, that's not acceptable if you are representing the other person. Okay, especially if there's going to be any situation where um, that, that <coughs> they could possibly sell it from underneath you, which they have. The second part is consideration. So we've gotten in the habit that we take a scan. Marie, can you turn that heat down a little? It's not. Okay, menopausal moment, right? Okay, all right. I'll not kick it off. Okay, all right. Yeah. Sure? Okay, so anyway. They're both on 58 and it's 70, so. Okay, gotcha. Can you open the door for a minute? No, 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 no. I'm fine. Okay. 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 We're talking about money, that's probably it. So anyway, so consideration. So, okay, let's come back. I'm sorry about that. I just thought I could get a little relief. Um, I know, you see me in my sweater, came off, threw it on the floor, rolled up the sleeves, <laughs> opened the cowl, you know, we're going to get some food. All right, so anyways, um, consideration. Consideration is money in this case. So our, poly our habits are that we, we take a picture of the check and send that picture of the check over with the offer. Okay, it gets accepted. We're like, okay, we'll give them the money. We'll see them, or we'll send it in the mail, or we'll have them pick it up, or we'll drop it off, or whatever. But we don't give them the money. They have a picture of the check. 
right? So they, there has been no money. They don't have it. Somebody else calls. They offer ten thousand dollars more, right? There's been no money trans transferred. They don't have to take your. They don't have to keep their their agreement to you. There's been no consideration. That copy of the check is worthless. Okay, so it behooves you to get in your car and drive that little sucker right over there as soon as you get an acceptance, or give it to them right away. Right? You know, they can rip up the check just as easily as you can. Right? They're not allowed to put it in the bank if they have it. But you know, our habits of doing things where we just send them a check because it's scanned. You know, unless we say you can, and even then, do we have? There's a form for permission to deposit or e-deposit that check. Right, so you have to get consent on that thing. So it's tricky. I thought you it should. had to go in escrow. It does have to go in escrow, but that es they still cash the check and they put the money in escrow. Yeah, so you're supposed to. Yeah, yeah the escrow goes to, if you're representing the buyer, the escrow goes to the listing agent. That's why she's saying you okay. need to go. Okay, I was, they thinking, cash I was the check. thinking that I, w I was the, list, the, the uh, seller's agent. I'm sorry. But, that, but that's a really good point because she just brought up, a, I mean, we've had many a bounce check because the person thought that all we do is hold the checks. <laughs> Because it, because we say like the money goes in escrow and then they go oh it goes in a little envelope in their drawer uh -huh. which is against the law so we don't do that because we try to stay out of real estate jail right so anyways the bottom line is you it's important if I can tell you like your habits get that money to them okay and if you're the seller's agent and the money comes to you get that money in the bank okay that's the law consideration is very important I we've lost some it's heartbreaking. When you lose a deal because you, you have the and you have the check, right? You have the check in your wallet, you know, and you're just waiting until what? I don't know, but you don't want to drive all the way up the road to give it to them, right? It's definitely worth it to bring it to them, okay? Legally competent parties, okay? So we talked about like what's a legally competent party? You know, um, are they able to sign it? You know, I have one lady. I was just so funny. She's going like, I never meet people at a restaurant and you know, over a beer to have them sign any paperwork. You know, because, you know, if, if you're drunk, it's voidable, right? Or if they're drunk, it's voidable. You know, and they say drunk or insane, I think is what the actual words are, right? So, which I always laugh at and make fun of, you know, when I'm teaching the class, but I'm not going to do that today, um, is that, you know, they need to be legally competent, okay? Um, that's what I said to that lady. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> well, you don't want anything to be voidable, because that's what it becomes is voidable. It doesn't become void on the spot. It just becomes voidable. Same thing with entering into an agreement with minors. It's valid, but it's voidable, right? Because that person could say that person's not old enough to sign it. You know? Um, all right, so legally competent parties. Consent. Okay, so it has to be that that person has agreed to do it. They consent to it. They consent normally by signing. We don't have acknowledgement. We don't notarize things. Okay, and then a legal purpose. So you have to have, like, again, back to that legal description of the property. You have to have something that's happening, okay? Like what the event is. Okay, there has to be a, a thing that's happening. Okay, the big takeaways on this are signatures on your paperwork. Okay, so don't let things float. Make sure you have some sort of signature. And the second thing is consideration. Those are the two that like, and we've also used them when people try to get out of things. Like the lawyer will go like, did you get the check? Do you have the check? <laughs> I'm like, no. And they're like, okay, then you can do it. You know, so. Um, all right, so the validity of a contract. I notice when I listen to myself, I don't finish any sentences. <laughs> and I like, kind of taper off, you know, my brain just kind of goes, like, you know, I'm like, the point is, and then I'm onto something else. All right, valid. It has all the legal elements of a contract. Void is it lacks, how do you know book, honey? <laughs> it lacks one or more element and has no legal force or effect, okay? Voidable has all legal elements on its face, but maybe rescinded or disaffirmed. Again, underage person, an insane person, or a drunk person. I like the three that, that, that they mentioned, I think. Um, and then unenforceable appears to have other legal elements, but cannot be enforced in, in, in court. I almost just said church. <laughs> all right, so discharge of contracts uh, could be from performance, which means that you sold the property, so now the contract is over. Um, assignment, assignment means that you, um, the, the person who is buying it assigns that contract to somebody else. Okay, so it's the same contract, but somebody else comes in. All right, so generally what happens for, like, for our purposes <coughs> is you're buying a property, you put it in your name, 
you decide to do a real estate trust or, or an LLC or something and so you so that that name comes in you assign it to that there's a there's a there's a when things are really hot in the market sometimes there's a, a job called bird dogging where you go and you find the properties and you put them under agreement and then you assign it to this other company or this other investing hi Denise Hello. how are ya good how are you everybody oh, good Sorry. oh no don't, don't be we love seeing you so that's assignment, okay? Normally it's to, like you, but just to another name. Sometimes it's to another person, okay? Um, and then novation would be similar to an assignment in that it goes to somebody else, but it's actually a new contract, gets drawn up. Okay, so um, that would be that I was gonna buy it, and I decided not to, but I, okay, say I was gonna buy it, but I decided not to, but I got another buyer, and they start a new contract. So that would be the same terms or whatever, but it's, novation means it's new, okay? So that's, so that's that one. Breach of contract. That would be when someone breaches it for whatever reason, that terminates the agreement. And then other reasons. I love that, other reasons. I don't know what the hell that is. All right. Okay, so contracts used in the real estate business, client representation agreements, right? Those are our what? Who wants to have it here? What is it, client? Client, client representation agreements. Buyer agents. Buyer agents on the buy side. What's it called on the sell side? Listing agreement, awesome. Uh, real estate contracts. Um, that would be the offer to sell, which is called what? Contract to sell, right? Contract to purchase. I'm sorry. Thank you. Contract to purchase. That's what it's you know that's what it's called now um, on our forms. We still call it an offer. The other would be a purchase and sales agreement. One could be a lease agreement. Any of those kind of things. Options. Um, that would be a lot of times there's a like a lease with an option to buy. Um, there could be other options that are available onto a contract. Um, an escrow agreement. Now, escrow agreements they use in, in other, company, uh, other companies, uh, other states, where the, the, they, ha they held an escrow and they held a title, they, they call it a couple different things. For our purposes, you know, our escrow is normally the, the fund that holds, holds the money, okay? Um, property management agreements, uh, leases, owner financing contracts, such as land contracts or contracts for deed. Okay, so this does happen to be a question that comes up a lot on the broker too, is um, owner financing land contract and a contract for deed would be that the owner is in some way or another financing the property. Okay, so either they are um, they're holding the deed and you're paying on it until at some point in time or they got to own the land and you are able to build the, the, the real estate on it. So there's a couple different ways that they may do it. Okay. All right, so sales contracts, we've got the offer, okay, the contract to purchase. We've got a counter offer. Okay, so here's the deal, right? When you look at that contract to purchase, there's a spot on there that's the counter offer, okay? When you are negotiating, all right, and let's just say they said, I'll pay $400,000, <laughs> uh, the date for the purchase and sales to be done is January 16th, the day of closing is one o'clock on March 30th. Okay, so there's all the terms they spelled out. So say you are the, the seller and you're like, you know what, everything is awesome, but I work that day, can we close at 3 p.m.? If one thing has changed, one thing that you don't agree to, then you have nothing, okay? So what happens a lot of times is that people will agree on the price and they think they're working out the, working out the details. Okay, you have nothing. So sometimes when I have buyers that are being particular, can everybody say hi to Jocelyn? Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so people have um, everything, there's just one little thing or whatever, they think that they're working out the details or they're kind of like trying to nail them on the details. Okay, don't. Get yourself in contract, okay? Um, and, and then from there, get the signatures, get, get that counter offer signed, right? There's a spot for counter offering to be signed so that you have an agreement. Okay, a lot of times what happens is the offer is made. We don't bother with the counter offer signature or the counter offer's acceptance. There's like three different blocks there. We just figure we'll get there because the PNS has been drawn up, but the PNS doesn't happen right away and something else comes along. Okay, so. Can you still initial and have them initial the change and then? You can, yes. Um, however, there's this, there's this, she's right. So when you are changing anything on that, so say, um, they change the date, they change the time, they may change the amount, you change it right on the offer, 
And the, any any time there's a physical change, or uh, an ink change on any contract, it has to be initialed. Okay. So you initial it, you initial it, and then you go to the bottom where it says a counter offer, and you say, I accept it with the changes. Okay. Or I reject this offer, but accept it with the changes. So you spell that out, and then you sign it. Okay. So you still need a signature. Just those um, initials are not going to cut it. Okay. So again, I know I'm beating a dead horse. But it's really important that you uh, you get yourself in that squat. Okay, so the next part of it is the acceptance. We just talked about the binder, which is the check, right? Um, it has to actually physically go to them. You can't show them a picture. That picture means nothing. Okay, I don't even know why we send the pictures. It's pretty stupid, quite honestly, because you know we just talked about the WISP policy before. So we have a WISP policy, a security policy that you're not supposed to be sending out like any sort of information about them, but yet we're sending the routing number and the tracking number through an email or a scan over to a company that has like no relationship with your person, but now they have all their, 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 their checking information. You know, so it's kind of a little crazy. <sighs> anyway, um, earnest money deposits. So again, that binder, the earnest money deposit is what they normally call that earnest money is the, the that first deposit. Okay, that's kind of meant to be like like the thing that holds it together. Equitable title is what they call like working title, which means that they don't own the house or they don't they don't they haven't paid if they buy a house for three hundred thousand dollars, you know, and uh, <clears throat> if they have not paid that three hundred thousand dollars, they have equitable title is like working title. You know, and so um, you would have that equitable title until you have paid off the house basically. Okay. Um, destruction of premises Again, back to Dave's fire, you know, once that happened, there was no longer a contract. Um, and liquidated damages. Uh, if there's a lot of times uh, an attorney will handle, will put in there, like if this agreement doesn't go through, the seller can keep the deposit for liquidated damages, which is like the, the damages that you feel that person might have gone through. Okay. Um, so those are all parts that might be in the contract. Okay, provisions of the sales contract. Who was talking about like what might go in those provisions? That might be, again, the, the, the silverware, not the silverware, the uh, appliances, that the uh, chandelier. chandelier, yeah, since we're back on our chandelier again. Right, any of those kind of provisions that might be, <laughs> it also might be other things like, um, you know, making an offer, but you want to have, uh, the, excuse me? Closing considerations. Closing considerations, yep, so seller's concessions. A lot of times the buyer, via their, normally their mortgage person on their mortgage person's suggestion, will suggest that they roll closing costs into it. So how they word that is that the seller agrees, they, they up the price that they agreed to, to a, or they, they start it and they, they offer either $3,000 or $5,000 towards seller's concessions and closing costs and prepaids. So that the, the, the net result is that they're, they're rolling in um, their closing costs, okay? Again, you don't need to know that. Like if you don't completely understand that, that's okay for right now. Um, any kinds of things <laughs> that might like you know due diligence you know making an offer on a property but you need to find out if they if you can put horses there you know and you need to go to the town or you're going to want it to build uh, an addition or a second floor and you wanted to make sure that you could were able to do it any kinds of provisions like that that might be a due diligence kind of issue you want to lock in the land so that you want to have that agreement but then you want to have time to make sure that you, you can do the things you want to do with it okay so my brother's a developer, and he always says to me, lock in the land, lock in the land, lock in the land. So, you know, I, it's, you get all the time to do your contingencies after, but you want to lock in the land so that you don't have the person do it. Okay, amendments and addendums. Okay, I'm going to get this right. An amendment is something that is added to a body of a contract, okay? So, um, like, the, the, you know, so if there's something that they want to add to it, they add an amendment onto it. Okay, um, an addendum is something that kind of changes the body of it. So it's something that is um, like added and changes it. Okay. Okay, I got that right. Do I have that right? I have that backwards. No, I get that backwards. Huh. Okay, I got that backwards. Okay, so. Amendment is the change, and addendum is the addition. Okay, so the amendment is the change. They the amend change it, so that makes sense. The and the, the addendum is the words. addition because it adds. Okay. Got that? <coughs> I feel like I wish I could rewind. Okay, so disclosures, 
Again, that's part of it. There's that lead paint disclosure. There's um, a home inspection possible disclosure. There's there's um, other disclosures that go in there. Um, any options? Again, we talked about that owner financing and land contracts. So those are all different options that happen. Those don't happen all that often. Okay. So beyond this unit, you're going to do all of those things that we always do. You're going to read through. You're going to get out that that bowl. You're going to record the questions and answers so that you can listen to them later. Okay. Um, so here we go. Let's do a couple quiz questions. A contract is said to be bilateral if one of the parties is a minor. It has yet to be per fully performed. Only one party is agreement to it. Both parties agree. Or both parties to the contract exchange binding promises. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. A buyer and seller sign a contract to purchase. The seller backs out, and the buyer sues for specific performance. But the buyer. Okay. So we didn't. Hey, Marie. Yeah. We need to add specific performance to Unit Twelve. A slide for specific performance. Okay, so specific performance is um, when the seller agrees to sell their property. Okay, we kind of were talking about this a little bit earlier about in Lindsay's example. Um, and then the buyer agrees to buy the property. Okay, so then the seller either gets cold feet or they don't have a place to go and they don't want to sell or. Um, in, the, in this divorce situation, uh, the, the, the wife signs the paperwork and agrees to it, but the buy, husband says no or whatever. So the buyer can compel that seller to hold up their end of the buyer bargain by specific performance. Okay, I remember one of my first transactions, and I was sitting there and I got a call, and my buy my seller could not find a place that he wanted to live. And it was like I don't know three weeks before the closing. And a guy that I worked with wrote big budget markers right next to me when I was talking to him. Because I was freaking out. Like, I'm like, you know, can't believe this is like my first listing and this guy doesn't want to sell his house and, you know, and he's writing specific performance. Tell him about specific performance. Okay, so specific performance means that they are compelled to sell it. So Lindsay, in your example, you didn't have people who had, who had signed that, like that, that seller never signed their agreement. So there was no specific performance there. Okay, the specific performance would come when you had the agreement and then the seller doesn't want to do it, okay? And then they can make them. We had a, we just had a case on this, just kind of interesting, and it ended up being that we had, it, you know, we had it worked out before the end of it, but we did get one of our clients get sued for specific performance. Okay, so what is the buyer seeking in this lawsuit? Money damage, new contract, efficiency judgment, or transfer the property? Transfer the property. They want that property that was promised to them. Okay, one more. The sales contract says that the buyer will purchase only if the attorney approves the sale by the following Saturday. The, the attorney's approval is a contingency, a reservation, a warranty, or a consideration? Contingency. Contingency. Awesome. Okay, so any questions on this chapter? Very important chapter. Okay, we're done. So